We're a pretty good group now. So good morning, everyone. Welcome to our third day of our virtual MAND refresher training. It's good to see you all. Um, let me make this screen a little bit smaller so I can see my slides. One second. Uh, it's not easy. Okay. So um, uh, this is what we're going to talk about today. Oops, there is something. Please ignore this bit in the middle. I don't know how that got there. <laughs> Sorry. So uh, we're going to have a, a recap of yesterday. Um, and we'll have a bit of time for that in the morning also to to answer your questions, um, have a bit of a discussion around what we talked about yesterday. And then we're going to talk about the first two steps of phase three. Um, so before I go into the recap, I actually would like to ask you um, whether um, one of you could perhaps tell us what were the most important points that we talked about yesterday? if you can still recall. Yes, please, Mark. Good morning to you all, and uh, it's a pleasure to be meeting you all once again. Good morning. I think uh, phase two had to do with, especially the data collection aspects that is supposed to feed into phase three, which is the enterprise planning aspects. I think the key point for me was ensuring that you are picking the data, um, taking cognizance of the five areas of enterprise development, including the market, including the environment and all the other um, areas. And I think one of the key things that also came up um, was the fact that we need to be able to do phase two on a much more regular basis, especially um, being able to review the uh, EDPs uh, on an annual basis, uh, if it allows to be able to take care of the exigencies of the time, because um, there is a change, uh, especially in various factors. And I think Isabel mentioned the fact that the legal and institutional change, which is very, very critical to be moving forward uh, in terms of phase two. And then, of course, also getting participants, project participants to be part of the process is a very important factor. So the facilitator really needs to get um, especially entrepreneurs, much more involved in the process of uh, ensuring that the data collection is done very well and also the interpretation of the data uh, for um, phase three. I think it also um, emphasized the fact that uh, data is very, very much required and there's a need to be able to build the capacity of smallholders to be able to undertake these data collections. And a number of data collection forms were shared and um, it's also part of the toolkit of the facilitators, which I believe will definitely be using um, as we move. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mark. That was a really, really good, succinct summary of what we talked about and, and the, the different points that are important to keep in mind when we, when we facilitate the data collection. Um, uh, is there anyone else perhaps who would like to perhaps talk about something that was maybe a bit problematic for them and where they felt yesterday that was good that we talked about that and they they learned something new or they they um uh, clarified something any aha moments that you had yesterday yes please tan yes Thank you, Kata. Good afternoon uh, from Vietnam to everyone. Uh, yeah. I, through the yesterday discussion, I have uh, one concern. If uh, someone uh, can help me, someone or Isabel, help me to uh, explain more about that is uh, very good. Uh, as we know that in the second phase, there, there are three steps in the Third uh, step and entrepreneurs choose the form of uh, business. Uh, in in the reality, when we support the MFP, uh, we uh, sometimes uh, uh, a little bit different. 
we change uh, step uh, three into step one. So it means that after the two uh, RFPO choose the form of uh, business, they uh, own together to uh, select in the formation uh, and um, uh, the information related to the product and collecting data to prepare for the, the business plan. Because uh, you, uh, you know that in the first phase, the step six of the first phase, the entrepreneurs, potential entrepreneurs, uh, uh, they realize the benefits of the group work. So, uh, so sometime in the beginning of the second phase, we would like to change the, uh, the step three into step one. Is that okay? Thank you. Yeah, so as you mentioned my name, so <laughs> I will answer your question. Yeah, I mean, of course, it's perfectly right. As long as you understand the objective of the steps and, uh, and you have enough data collected to take a decision of what you are searching for, for example, what type of uh, form will take the enterprise, actually, it, it's perfectly fine. That means also that you use very well the phase one. And actually, usually phase two uh, is also depending what has been done or not done in phase one. So if phase one has been has been done has been done perfectly, and and the local potential entrepreneurs has been involved in the reflection of what type of enterprise is feasible in our country, what type of uh, uh, status. Uh, we can do as uh, our own group, then of course you can decide right away if, if, if all the information are there and all the people are clear about the, the potential options. If not, this is dependent in uh, in end of, of, phase, of phase two, because in collection of data of, of step one, they are supposed to deepen against this, this aspect if they have not done in phase one. So, and, and this is an example of, of course, M and D is only a tool. It's a process that you can use also uh, according to your needs, as long as information is there and people are participating fully. So yes, Tang, I think it's it's perfectly all right if you if you change the uh, sequence of the steps. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Isabel. Does that clarify your question, Tal? Does that answer your question, Tal? Yes, uh, I, I understand. It means that it's uh, very flexible for us when we implement it. Thank you. Thank you, Isabel. Thank you, Tang. Thank you, Isabel. I can see Grace's hand up. Please, Grace. Karibu. Asante. Good morning, all. I am sorry. Yesterday, I could not follow up the discussion. I had a network challenge. But I, 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 I have some sort of... Uh, this is not a question, whatever that I want to understand regarding phase two. If there is a formal guide or a format that can lead on data collection. Another thing is I want to know who are supposed to collect those data under phase two. But again, I was, I was wondering if the intervention is new in the area as in under my case, because what he drive the potential producer to select beekeeping was the environment, but also the, the need of the community to get the honey. We normally, I can say we export honey from other regions, from Tanzania, but we don't have enough honey from our place, but the honey is required. So that there's a motive behind the group that let us keep bees so we can sell the honey within our community. So if it, under that circumstance, also their data is collected, that's what I want to know. Thank you. Um, Isabel, did you want to respond or do you want me to go first? 
you can you can yes. add on what you okay um so um Perhaps I park your first question regarding um, templates or, or a formal a formal guide. I wanted to first respond to your second question on who should do the data collection. Um, so uh, ideally, because not everyone will be able to to collect data, to have the have the time and also the means to also travel to to places a bit beyond the community boundaries. Um, it would be good for the group to nominate um, a few people who will serve as data collectors. Um, and there is also a possibility, of course, for the group to, to put some money together to, to enable this person to buy bus tickets, et cetera, and to spend some time in different markets um, talking to different informants. And ideally, those people should be mobile, um, should be willing to to do this and travel and and be able to uh, to communicate well, um, understand the objectives of the of the data collection, why it's being done, and also be able to report back to the group. And importantly, also to record, so they should be able to read and write, um, so that they can record the data they collect in the field. Um, and then um, your last question around the situation where you already identified that there is a demand for honey within your community, whether you should still collect data on this. My answer is yes. Uh, yes, you should, um, because you don't know what the demand is exactly for what type of for what type of honey, what is the quality that you need? And there are some big differences in, in the quality of honey that you can produce. Um, but also there may be further opportunities um, uh, also outside the community. So you should also look beyond. Um, and on, the, on your first question regarding formal guidelines, um, the the toolkit itself, the the MAND toolkit, does not contain formal guidelines, um, but it also depends on the selection criteria that you are going to identify for your product. So um, you have to be uh, perhaps also a little bit creative and and see what is it exactly, what data do I need to collect for each for each product and for each area of enterprise development. Um, I don't know whether Isabelle or Jacques would like to add to that or to the other points um, I talked about. Um, yes, no, I think you 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 covered the, the point. Uh, just to insist a bit on on the data collection, uh, and it was mentioned yesterday by by Yvonne, I think from Vietnam, is when you need uh, uh, information which are out of reach. For, for the local people, you may also uh, uh, link to some networks, existing networks who have uh, branches in other districts or other provinces, like, like uh, a chamber of commerce or industry, like a farmers organization, or, or uh, well, in the case in, in, in uh, Vietnam, I think it was uh, uh, women, um women organization having branches everywhere and and then you can uh, get information uh, through these networks and it comes back to you at the, at the local level um for, for the templates we i think kata you you mentioned it you have in the field facility guidelines kind of checklist of potential question or area of investigation and of course you have to to own it and to 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 uh, make it your uh, adapted to your context and your uh, uh, products. So there is additional work to be done to to prepare your own questionnaire. Then and most of the time we ask the local people, the, the potential entrepreneurs, to participate in in this, uh, uh, even writing the questions themselves, so that the they, they, they start to really think through what they need for, for this product, et cetera. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Isabel. Grace, does that answer your questions? Yes, thank you so much. That's great.
Is there perhaps someone else? Yes, please. Um, I don't know what your first name is, Mr. Simanto. Sorry, you're on mute. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. Um, uh, I, I think I, I just want to contribute to, to what my friend has asked about uh, who collects data in phase one. Uh, in our Kenyan experience is that what we did was we, well, we, we also had community-based data collectors that we got from the FFPOs and we take, took them through a training where they did their own checklist and they went to collect the data. And I think that is more sustainable. Uh, uh, also, we train them a lot on, on, on simple skills of, of collecting the data, how to communicate, yeah, communication techniques, um, and how can you, how they can interact with the market actors. Yeah, we have to train them that on, on how they can interact with the market actors. And they came with very, very pretty good data that we used to develop the business plans later. Uh, so you, you may look within the FFPO and find that the, 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 there's a, a group of people uh, who, who are able to, to interpret the questions, who are able to, 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 to talk to the local communities, and who are also able, who are literate within the, the group, then you train them on that specific aspect. Uh, then, um, the, 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 the participation of the local entrepreneurs is, is, is also critical, yeah? The participation of the local entrepreneurs is, is quite critical because there's a problem of uh, the facilitators making the data collection, a top-down activity, maybe done from the project level to the community, and the, the community can feel very, very uncomfortable. Uh, but when you have this small group from the FFPOs themselves going out to interact with the market, then of course you find there's a lot of trust that is being created between the groups and the and, and the market actors. So that's what we have done in Kenya, and and, and I think it, it it adds a lot of value to the entire MD process. So I could not join you for the last two days. Uh, I'll be available today and tomorrow. Thank you very much. Wonderful, welcome. Uh, we're yeah. we're really glad that you can join us, and thank you so much for these insights from how you selected data collectors and, and trained them also. I think this is a really crucial point, um, which I was going to talk about in, in the recap of what we talked about yesterday, the, the idea that the, the data collectors need, need some training in many cases on how to talk with people, how to, how to record data, um, et cetera. But also, sorry, you wanted to come in again, please? Yeah, and and also it um, by training the um, the local the, the local community members, it creates a bit of sustainability and also cost effectiveness in collecting the data because they do it at their own time at the local level. Uh, they make their own schedule. They go and collect the data. So, but of course, we need somebody to supervise. Yeah, sometimes you you must have one also person at the local level. We strain to supervise and see that there is good data that is coming from the from the field. Thank you. That's really really valid points. Thank you very much. Yes, indeed, the 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 inclusion of of the the, the local the actors um, in the whole M A N D process is is really crucial. And um, um, sorry, Yao, can you welcome? <laughs> Would you please mute your mic just for a second? Um, yes, to create also the trust and but also to create sustainability um, because then those skills will remain in place and the, the entrepreneurs will be able to, to collect data once the project has left in order to adapt to changing conditions um, and um, the, the situation um, around them. Yeah. Bonjour, Yao. Good morning. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> um, Okay, uh, is there anyone else perhaps who would like to still um, ask a question or make a comment on what we talked about yesterday or talk about their experiences, any issues they might have faced? Okay, well then let me quickly share my screen again.
Sorry, I'm having trouble. Oh, Johnny, please. Yes, uh, um, thank you. I'm happy to see all of you participating. I just want to remark that in this issue about data collection, it's very important to request the um, collectors and the producers to collect only data that are interesting for them and that they feel that it is useful and, and not overload them with things that could be also a curiosity for us, for the guys who want to investigate something from them. Should be really something that they see the, the value to invest their time on this and they see also the impact or results of this data collection in their family and their lives and if we do that, they will do that with pleasure and will be also sustainable because they will see the results. Over. Thank you, Johnny. Yes, indeed. This is something that we talked about yesterday, that it is important to, to, to discuss the scope of the, the survey and to, to not go overboard and uh, collect too much data. Um, and we said that um, in each area of enterprise development for small enterprises it is often sufficient to collect data around two to four different criteria in each area um, and uh, yes and yes and of course it's it's important that this data is reliable so it's better to collect a smaller amount of data that is good quality and reliable data rather than a vast quantity of different types of data that might not be so reliable and useful consequently. Okay, um, so let me share my screen. Okay, you should be able to see my screen now. Yes. Yes, wonderful. Um, so just very briefly, we talked yesterday um, we first talked a little bit about the preparation of phase two and the transition from phase one and phase two and and talked about how it's important to not let too much time go past um, and to to also sort of check again whether everyone's still on board and 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 whether there are any major issues they encountered in phase one so try to correct those as you move into phase two. And then we talked about the data collection and we said that the first point is the market chain analysis um, because uh, you need to understand whether there is potential market for the different product ideas. Um, if there is none, there is no point in, uh, select, in uh, collecting data for the other selection criteria in the other areas. Um, and then of course, um, once the data comes back, the, we talked about how um, the different products are, in, are then scored for the different areas, for the different selection criteria and ranked. And that this ranking is really a guide and not a, not a fixed outcome um, saying the top ranking product needs to be chosen. It really is more of an indication of which products will face um, or which enterprise ideas will face less um, constraints as they move along in their development. Uh, and then we talked about um, we talked about this in the beginning, but also in the end about enterprise forms and this complexity um, of setting up group and enterprises. Um, so I just have one more. Yes, I have your. I can see your hand up, Bohanki. Please go ahead. Thank you very much for giving me the floor. In fact, uh, when I was uh, reading the recap for day two, it is written uh, analysis uh, of uh, market chain instead of talking the value chain that uh, need to be analyzed. So I don't know, are we just uh, talking about uh, market chain analysis or are we going to talk about uh, value chain analysis? Thank you. That's a good question. I would perhaps like to pass it on to my co-trainers, Isabelle or Jacques. Jacques, 
Bon, so, je ne sais pas où est Jacques, donc je vais, <rire> je je vais là, parler. Je suis là. Ah, yeah. tu, tu, prends, tu prends cette question euh, À mon avis, au départ, In English. il y a deux temps. Hein, le, dans le premier temps, pour euh, la phase 2, on fait, on, on fait l'analyse de la chaîne de commercialisation. Parce que ça permet aux villageois de bien comprendre comment est organisé Uh, you need to analyze the chain in phase two because this will allow to see how the value chain is organized. Yes, but if the entrepreneur would like to uh, process its product instead of selling the Uh, raw materials, uh, it's, it would it be important to see, to analyze the value chain. You know, the marketing chain uh, starts from the raw materials all the way to the final product. Therefore, the product can be processed at any level from the raw materials all the way to the final project. So generally speaking, Uh, the interest will be to see what is the uh, initial product and what is the final product and see what happens right from the beginning to the end. Uh, so it might be uh, at the end we have a different product or the same product. Uh, so it could have, you know, uh, been uh, changed or processed on the way. I don't know whether this is clear. I just realized I was on mute. Sorry. <clears throat> uh, okay. Uh, yes. Yeah, so that I just wanted to very briefly um, also reflect on some of the the questions or perhaps issues that came up yesterday. So here I called it pitfalls, but really it was, was more sort of questions perhaps, um, or, or important points to, to remind ourselves of from yesterday. So we talked about the complexity of group enterprises and we talked about the importance of being very clear about um, how benefits are shared within a group enterprise Or, um, and I think it was uh, Clifford who talked yesterday about an example where a private business person hired group assets to run his enterprise and there were some, some payments made towards the, the group, um, but essentially it was a partnership. So also in these kind of setups, it needs to be very clear how benefits are distributed to the group members. So what is really important in whatever form the, the enterprise or a group enterprise is set up is that there is a clear definition of the activities of the group. Who does what and what do they receive in return? Um, and uh, so it's very, very important to define objectives of the group and the activities, each activity. And it's, this needs to be clear from the beginning. Um, and then um, it's also important that an enterprise idea designed by someone else, perhaps a project team, is not forced on groups as this will not be sustainable. The group members really need to be able to decide freely whether this, this setup works for them and whether they benefit from it or not. Um, and then just very briefly, again, we, we talked about this also just now about the, A, the importance of training data collectors, but also um, the importance of building capacities of the facilitators, because the facilitators are really crucial and their capacities are really crucial in accompanying and supporting the entrepreneurs as they develop their ideas and their business plans. So the, the facilitators should really have an idea of what what an entrepreneurial culture is, entrepreneurial thinking. They should also have um, some good skills around data collection and interviewing uh, so that they can pass this on to, to the, those who are nominated as data collectors from the group. So um, 
uh, a key role for a FFPO business incubation unit could be, for example, to train the facilitators in these in these skills and these capacities. Okay. Um, so I think we discussed all questions, unless um, unless anyone else did want to have a, a final comment on yesterday. I keep looking there as if I'm not. <laughs> yes, please, Oscar, please. Uh, 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 can you please uh, bring back your previous slide? Eh? Yes. Just for a moment. Yes, just for a moment. Yeah, on, on, on the issue of transparency and accountability, uh, 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 on this issue of complexity of group enterprises, the, the issue of transparency becomes very, very critical. And uh, really transparency here will, 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 will be looked at in many aspects. There is transparency leadership, there is transparency in financial management, there is, financial, there is transparency needed in uh, in implementation of activities. And there's also, in case the groups have gotten grants, then of course the members have to be very, very clear about how the finances are being spent. Uh, what we have done in Kenya, especially to define the activities, is that we bring the, the group leaders together and, and, and then what we do is to, to make sure that we have a clear agenda, yeah, a very clear agenda with the group leaders so that they're able to move together with their groups. Um, and normally before implementation, we will have that kind of workshop in which we, we discuss their work plans, their budgets, their implementation modalities, the implementation matrices. So we have to discuss all that in a meeting, especially with the group leaders. Uh, then to enhance transparency, we have a lot of trainings on, 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 on record keeping, issues of record keeping at, at the group level. How do they do simple filing? Yeah, filing of letters. Yeah, uh, letters with folio numbers. All those things come in. Uh, how do we do? They file financial receipts. Yeah, and also financial statements, even if they're from the bank. Financial withdrawals. All of those things come in. Uh, how do they take their own simple minutes? Yeah, minuting of of meetings. Th those things are critical in enhancing the transparency and accountability within. The, 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 the FFPOs. Uh, the mistake that, that facilitators make is trying to force their ideas uh, on the group members, and it can be very, very dangerous. Yeah. The facilitators should just facilitate processes so that things happen in the, in the, in the FFPOs. Mm -hmm. But let the ideas come from the members. We are not saying that the facilitators cannot comment or cannot give guidance, though they should be able to give guidance on an activity that has been agreed upon. And if it has not been agreed upon, also the, the facilitator can also inform the members that I think this, this activity is good. Uh, it has all these advantages and disadvantages, and I think you could consider it. But just go think about it, and you, we can discuss that one in a later meeting. But don't, don't force it on them. Yeah, don't, don't, don't force an, an idea, uh, especially a business idea, enterprise idea on the members, especially on the products. Let them choose it by themselves. So that is what we have done in, in, in trying to enhance transparency and accountability. Uh, then of course, the capacity building for the facilitator is also very critical, especially in enhancing, for example, interviewing skills, yeah? How do we enhance their ability to interact, their, their ability to, to communicate, their ability to interview, yeah? Th th those, are, those are critical issues that we do with the facilitators plus the data collectors so that they're able to be very, very efficient in carrying out the data collection exercise. Our, our business incubation model in Kenya, uh, we have actually done business incubation model through exchanges. We find it, we, we find it more practical. If there's a, an FFPO doing very well, so we'll take the members to that FFPO in an exchange visit, and they will spend time with that group just to learn what they are doing yeah, and how they are doing things. And we find that one very practical at the local level because it is sometimes very difficult to take somebody from a group and go attach them in another as part of the business incubation model. But if they can have two, three days interaction, then they will learn how they are doing their thing, how they are doing their business, 
how they are doing their packaging, and then they go back and, 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 and do that one in their own FFPO. That's our model for business incubation. So thank you very much. Thank you, Oscar. Uh, really, really good to hear about um, how you've um, you've set up things in, in Kenya. And I just had one follow up question um, around um, the you said in the beginning, you, you bring together the group leaders and and discuss with them the importance of transparency and also train them in using tools that will allow for a greater transparency. Um, I just wanted to understand how does this then trickle down to the actual group members um, so that there is um, a sort of democratic, uh, a really democratic process and, and, and the group members um, can see that there is transparency and can actually also contribute to how the, the, the group enterprise is set up. I just wanted to clarify that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, th that's a good clarification. Um, normally, we also treat the leaders as, as TOTs, trainer of trainers, yeah? Sometimes, and, and when we are, we are also selecting the, the people who are to attend the meeting, we also ensure that we have the participation of the youth within the group, the participation of women within the group. Uh, and it's not only the leaders that we bring on board, but we also bring on very critical members of the group, yeah, that we think are very critical. In, in enhancing uh, passing of messages and all that. So you bring quite a, quite a mixed grill of uh, the leaders plus a few of other members so that they're able to go back and also inform the other members that this is exactly what you want to do on these areas of transparency and accountability. Then we have also developed our own tools. For example, we have developed an organizational capacity development tool that we have been using with FFPOs, with FFPAC. We have, uh, we have something on leadership. Yeah, we have something on which, which we also are uh, in our own when you are doing our own monitoring and evaluation, then we also expose them to this. Sometimes if we feel that the entire group needs a training on leadership, then we give that particular training, yeah. Okay, thank you. Just another follow-up question, um, because you you were sort of explaining how um, you don't only just um, gather the group leaders, but also sometimes some, some other members of the group, um, and that they will then go back to their group as actors, as, as trainers themselves and pass on information. So I can see how there is an information channel going from the top to the, to the bottom. And does that also allow for information to go the other way from the individual group members to be fed back to the leadership and to these leadership circles, to these leader circles? Sorry, our infusional capacity assessment tool provides for feedback from the members. Yeah, the members can provide feedback into their reports and all that, and this will come to FSPAC for compilation for, for, for the entire project. Okay, so, that's interesting. So, so we allow a two-way communication process. It's not just top-down, but you also allow the members to actually input even to those small reports, so that we, when they come now, they come as a report that is owned by the members. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much for these clarifications. Sorry for all my questioning. Um, yeah, thank you, thank you. Uh, Clifford, I can see your hand up, please. Yes, uh, my, my question also had to do with the one you just asked uh, in terms of feedback, uh, but I was looking at the component of the TOT. Uh, and I don't know what mechanism they put in place to ensure that people who have been taken through a TOT are actually able to pass on whatever learnings they have gotten to uh, the, the entire group. Because uh, I know, for instance, in, uh, in Ghana, many, many instances, we do TOTs, but then uh, we don't do the follow-ups to ensure that uh, they, when the people return, they are actually passing on that information to the entire group. So I only wanted to learn from him, uh, from his experience, what mechanisms are in place to ensure that people are actually able to deliver uh, TOTs, uh, further trainings to the entire group uh, after they have received the TOT trainings from them. I, that is the clarification I, I seek from him, yeah. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Clifford. Uh, 
Um, just to, uh, sometimes you must have a you must make a deliberate effort, especially in your monitoring framework, just to ask simple questions on what kind of information have they been able to pass to the members and which which feedback have they been able to get back from their members. So when we are when we are doing our M and D tool, you know, we do we periodically update our M and D tools just to discover to 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 to, to just to observe and see uh, whether information is trickling down or is not trickling down. So you must have a deliberate you must have a deliberate effort to just see how is the information flowing uh, within the group itself. Yeah. Uh, then I agree with you. Sometimes because of financial constraints, then of course follow ups become a bit difficult. But within the group setup, uh, what we have done is that we, we have also created a small group that does monitoring, yeah, internal monitoring of the group activities. So that also assists us to get information about what's happening. Uh, it is very important, for example, if, if, if you want people to do issues of marketing properly, yeah. So within the FFPOs, what you know, we, we normally do is that we get a smaller group that is going to be in charge of the marketing aspect. Another smaller group that is going to do project implementation. Another group that is going to do monitoring of the entire activities within the group. So that one assists us also to get feedback very, very fast. Uh, and know that this information is flowing and things are going in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you, Oscar. Thank you, Clifford. Okay. Um... Any other questions right now? Then let me move along in my slides and um, talk about, start talking about phase three. So this is as a reminder where we are in the process. Um, phase three is, um, um, so the objective of phase three um, is to formulate the plans for the enterprises and develop enterprise strategies and prepare for implementation. So the role of the facilitator in this phase is to assist the entrepreneurs to prepare their enterprise development plans. And this will be done by analyzing the data obtained in the previous phase. So in phase three, the entrepreneurs will describe the goals of their enterprise formulate their objectives, develop strategies, draw up action plans, uh, assess the profitability of the enterprise and determine capital startup needs. Uh, so the potential entrepreneurs usually have some difficulty in visualizing the profile of their enterprise solely on the basis of the data collected in phase two. Um, so before they can go further, they need to become familiar with the methods and tools they will use to develop the most appropriate enterprise ideas and strategies. And this is what will happen in step one. Um, the outcome of step two um, will be the enterprise development plans prepared by the entrepreneurs. And finally, in uh, step three, you the facilitators will analyze the enterprise development plans together with the entrepreneurs um, identify perhaps if there are corrections to be made or further reflections to be done and um, also identify the training and assistance needs in order to decide on a support strategy during the startup phase of the enterprise. So let's talk about uh, step one. Uh, to ensure that the entrepreneurs can prepare their ADPs, they need to be familiar with the methods and tools used to define the strategies in the five areas of enterprise development. So the main objective of step one is to familiarize the entrepreneurs with these tools. Um, and during the step, the entrepreneurs will also identify the best options for financing their enterprises. So I'm gonna stop sharing now because I would like to have another chat with you um, to talk about step one of phase three um, and uh, ask you, how did you, uh, how did you implement this first step? And were there any challenges that you encountered in, in the sort of preparation of gearing up to for entrepreneurs to prepare their enterprise development plans?
I guess um, what I I also would like to to point out that um, it is the the boundary between step one and step two is perhaps not so clear. Um, so it's it's really I think this step, um, if I understood this correctly, and I I would love <laughs> Isabel and Jack to come in and correct me, um, is to to I mean they 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 come back with the data collectors come back with this range of information, and um, and the step from looking at this data that comes perhaps in a format that is not really easy to understand or not really good to have an overview of is to is to um, to sort of look at the the different constraints and the different solutions that you've collected uh, or the the entrepreneurs that the data collectors have collected for the different um, criteria for the different enterprise development areas um, and to sort of try to start developing strategies to to answer to those constraints um, and during this phase to also become familiar with some of the calculations they will have to make or some of the the, the thinking that they will have to do before they start the calculations. Yeah, may I add something? Please. Yeah. Um, yes, the, the boundary between step one and two is, is very arbitrary, let's say. Let's see, uh, step two, step two is actually formalizing the document, the enterprise development uh, plan uh, but to be able to do that, you need a, a, a number of analysis of the data you collected in step two, and which is step one. So you could perfectly say it's a big step produ producing the enterprise development plan with two sub steps will, would be analyzing the data and on this basis, taking decision in each of the five areas and put it in, in a form that would be readable for, especially for those that you, you will contact to receive some support to, to start your enterprise. So yeah, uh, it, it seemed more uh, clear and user-friendly to, to split it in two steps so that there is an analysis and then the document. But as also Tang was mentioning uh, before, you could perfectly, uh, start your training saying, okay, you have this templates of EDP. Now let's see how we fill it in. And doing that, you need some pre-calculation. You need some pre-analysis. That means you, you will have to go back from the templates to analysis, templates to calculation, to be able to have a final enterprise development plan, which can be uh, uh, presented to somebody else. Is, is it clear this, what, what I'm seeking? I, I pose the question to the group. Are you, do you have any question? Any questions on this? Please, Oscar. Yeah, maybe the Kenyan experience. And um, actually, the different. The, 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 the boundary between phase one and phase two is very thin, that's true. But phase, phase, phase three is quite critical uh, in, in, in now bringing all this uh, data, data collected into perspective. We just want to bring the data into perspective. Uh, and that means that you, you, you may need to hold in-depth discussions with, with the data collectors, just look at trends, averages, you know, so that uh, you, you you don't put into the business plan data that is quite uh, way off. Yeah, so I think that that is a that, that is a very important. Uh, and then of course, uh, when making decisions on the five areas of enterprise development, uh, it is it is also very important that you discuss this with, with with the data collectors plus the group members, so that they are able to understand that it this decision is being made on their behalf and it's them. Who should own it? Yeah, you 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 must ensure that there is ownership when they are discussing the five areas of enterprise development. And what what we have seen in Kenya is that uh, when we start with the small groups before even we consolidate them into big associations and cooperatives, 
uh, the smaller groups can take some time to understand entrepreneurship. Yeah, to have an entrepreneurship mind can take a bit of time, and it's nice to be patient with them and take them slowly through it so that they understand that we want to convert them into entrepreneurs. So it, 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 they shouldn't be rushed so so fast. Let it develop also organically among them that uh, we, we want to change course. We want to change from very small subsistence groups to, to bigger entities that are able to collect, uh, do joint marketing and, and, and all that. So uh, here, the, the, the facilitator has to make a decision, yeah? Of how much data do you, uh, how much information do you take on board? Uh, how much, uh, which of this information is critical? And that's why I agree with the, the, the comment that Johnny Sapata made earlier that you, you must be very, you must actually target the most critical information that you need to enable you to develop the business plan. Otherwise, you bore these people with a lot of information and it doesn't become useful when you're doing the enterprise plan. So that is, the, that is what our Kenyan experience is, uh, that you must just ensure that the, the most important data is collected in, in phase one and phase two, and that data that comes into phase three is the most critical data that you need to enable you to develop, develop the official enterprise plan. Yep. Yep. Thank you, Oscar. This was a really, really good summary. Um, of why why the step is important i really like the point that you made about giving entrepreneurs time to 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 understand what 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 entrepreneur thinking is and what is going to be necessary to to draw up their plans for that to to, to lead them slowly in through the process uh it looks like isabel would like to say something just additional on small point is also to see uh the flexibility of the process uh when, when you think you are ready for preparing the enterprise development plan, actually, while doing it, you may also find out that some uh, information are still uh, lacking. So although you are still, you are already in phase three, there's no, 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 no worry to go back and to have a very uh, clear and, and short a collection of information again, just to feed in one point where you lack, uh, you realize that you lack, uh, you lack some information. So there is a kind of going to 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 phase three and a little bit going back to to collection of information uh, to to be able to actually fill in the enterprise development plan and to take really based uh, decision on this. That's only what I wanted to add. Thank you, Isabel, for this addition. Um, is there anyone else who would like to perhaps recount their experience or has any questions on this rather fluid step one, step two setup in phase three? Um, perhaps I would like to take a step back if you allow and ask you, um, why is it that that we need to plan? What what? Why do we need an enterprise development plan? And What 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 is the what is the purpose of having having such a planning done and the the the, the purpose of having this document at the end of the process? Please, Tuan. Yeah. Uh, hello, Kata and Miss Isabel and everyone. Um, as a facilitator, um, when we uh, work with Pamela, we have to persuade and help Pamela. Um, understand about MAND and using tool to make EDP, but uh, but um, uh, they don't have a habit to make a EDP plan, uh, EDP. So uh, for first in advance, we have to work with them and uh, help them uh, realize, realize uh, the, uh, uh, the benefits of EDP. 
Uh, and um, uh, after discussing, after discussing, farmer uh, re realize that ADP help them to uh, make a clear view about what we, uh, what they will done, we, that what they will do in the few, in this year or next seasons, and uh, help them calculate uh, calculate uh, more clearly about the money or cash what that they have and 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 after that they make um, um, make um, preparing for for for, um, for for the plan and also uh, they um, and the most important thing that are uh, just uh, uh, each each farmer in uh, FFPO uh, have uh, the same view about what the, they uh, what they will do in the next year or next season. Yes, and uh, many uh, benefits. Maybe we can learn from other countries. Thank you, Kata. Back to you. Thank you, Tuan. Uh, yes, uh, yes, great. Um, interesting that you you've also started with you need to also as a facilitator lead to an understanding of what an EDP is for and what are the benefits. And you mentioned that it's that one of the main um, um, benefits of having an EDP is that the producers and the entrepreneurs are able to calculate um, how their activities are going to pay off and 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 what they will have to uh, invest and and um, and see where where they will be able to and how they will be able to profit from their business. Um, and I would also like to take up the, your last point if there is perhaps someone else from another country who would like to uh, to tell us why 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 an EDP is 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 necessary or what what are the benefits of having this planning process and this planning document at the end? Please, Edwin. Thank you, Kata. Uh, I'd like to agree with Thorn that uh, the EDP provides a roadmap for the entrepreneurs, but it also provides a uh, you know, a platform for the entrepreneurs to be able to source for support in terms of financing, in terms of uh, other kinds of support service from service providers. Thank you. Yes, very important point. Thank you, Edwin. Yes, it is indeed um, a formalization uh, um, of, of what the, the entrepreneur is going to be about and um, a very transparent document that will allow the a potential financial service providers to see the logic of the enterprise and whether it's worth for them investing in this enterprise. Um, okay. Um, and could you perhaps um, talk about what are the different strategies that will that will form part of an enterprise development plan? So we've talked about finances and and what what other what other areas does an enterprise development need to cover to to give a full picture of the 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 operation of the enterprise and its 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 impact. Please, Mark. Oh, Mark, we, we could not hear you. Floor is yes. yes. Yes, thank you so much. I think um, at key other areas would have to do with the environment, um, especially to do with the sustainability of the uh, enterprise and um, the kinds of activities that the producer organization or the producer group would be undertaking towards the environment. So for instance, for a honey group, you need to be doing certain practices um, to be able to ensure that the environment sustains your honey business and also provide for um, continued availability of, um, of honey. And then, of course, also apart from the environment, you need to also look at some social and institutional arrangements, especially that you want to uh, partake in uh, as we discussed yesterday. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Yes, so environment and institutional 
institutional. So the resources and the um, a resource plan, a resource strategy, and a, a strategy around organization and legality. Um, Wahangi, would you like to compliment? Yes, yeah, sure. Thank you. What I wanted to add uh, is that uh, the EDP is uh, like a dashboard for the future entrepreneur so that uh, he can carry on uh, his activities and then uh, the aspect that should be taken into account in this uh, EDP is that uh, they have to align you for the five domains of uh, the development of enterprise, not just uh, finance and environment. You have to think about the legal aspect. You have to ask the question if the product that I want to develop is uh, allowed in my country or, or not. You have to take into account the social aspect as also the uh, gender and equity aspect should be taken into account. I talk about uh, the legal aspect and then technology as well. We should not forget uh, technologies that are needed to be used in the project. Thank you very much. Yes, indeed. Um, and we've talked about this before and we keep repeating it, it is that the five areas of sustainable enterprise development are of importance in every phase of the development of an enterprise and very critical also to include in the enterprise development plan. So strategies in each of the five areas. Okay. Um, I am quite keen to get to the calculations part. So perhaps um, I'm going to share my screen again so we can, sorry, Bohangi, you're, you're, oh, okay, sorry. I thought you wanted to say something still. Um, so I'm quite keen to, to perhaps um, show you the slides that I've prepared um, on this particular, step one and on the strategies very briefly. Let me just find my screen again, <laughs> sorry. We have said that um, uh, the an enterprise development plan is a document that results from the enterprise planning exercise and that it describes the enterprise and the, the different strategies um, around the enterprise. Um, so, and what is it useful for? It's useful to assess future performances. Um, it's useful to communicate the intention of the business, to, um, to clarify also the intention, um, not just towards perhaps financial service providers, but also amongst enterprise partners, perhaps, if they exist. Um, and yes, the last point, the last two points we've already talked about. So convince um, a service provider, a financial service provider, that this this enterprise is, is based on a solid plan and there is um, the necessary research has gone into, into identifying um, strategies for each area of the, of the enterprise. So it should be designed by the entrepreneur, of course, with support from the facilitator. It should be realistic, otherwise um, in a real world, it will not be sustainable. Um, it should be comprehensive, so it should co cover all areas of the enterprise. We've talked about this. It should be very clear. Um, and it should also convince the, the reader, uh, or in this case, for example, a, a finance provider, that it was indeed also designed by the person who is presenting it, uh, so by the entrepreneur and not perhaps prepared by someone else for them. Um, and this will add to the credibility of the entrepreneur. Um, and the enterprise development plan should be adapted to the capacities of the entrepreneur. Um, so it really should be clear also to them. So what are the different strategies? And I apologize to the, our French speaking colleagues that this is only in, in English, um, but I will talk through it and hopefully that the interpreters will be able to, to follow. So, the product assessment tables from phase two are really the starting point um, for the development of these strategies. In the product assessment table, the opportunities, constraints, and possible solutions for each product in each area of business development were 
um, were drawn up and gathered. And now it's time to think about the potential solution to the constraints. So converting really action points into specific enterprise strategies. And as a general, and we've talked about this on day one, the enterprise strategy should be based on marketing and not on selling. And um, essentially, the enterprise development is a series. Enterprise development is a series of decisions under seven categories. So, um, there it will contain a marketing strategy, a marketing plan. So, what is your competition? What are its characteristics? What market segments do you want to target? What are the characteristics of your potential customers? How will you set the price for your product? What is unique about your product? And then you will have an operational plan. So how many units of your product do you plan to produce, stock and sell? Um, what are your equipment, raw materials, packing and utility requirements? Um, and then you will have a responsibilities and management plan. So if you want um, the, the five areas of enterprise development are sort of pulled apart a little bit uh, because you have more than five strategies in the enterprise development plan. So you will have a responsibilities and management plan. So what will be the legal structure? Um, how will you organize the organization? What, um, uh, how will you pay salaries and what will you pay in salaries and wages? Um, and then you will have the resource management plan or the resource strategy. What will you do to sustain your resources and what costs will this incur? Um, and uh, there is also the social uh, development plan, which is uh, really important. So what will you do to provide social benefits to the, to the communities and at what costs to the enterprise will you conduct these activities? You'll also have, importantly, a risk management plan. So what could be potential problems in the five areas of enterprise development and what are potential solutions for those? And very importantly, of course, you will have your profitability calculations and financial projections. So what is your forecast for profit and losses? And this is where you include depreciation, fixed costs, variable costs, um, estimated re sales revenues, et cetera. And we'll talk about these in a bit. Um, here's where you calculate perhaps your break-even point. You'll calculate the payback period for investment. Uh, you will cal calculate your calculate your cash flow analysis and um, present your balance sheet. Okay, so I'm just going to stop sharing again because um, this is what I wanted to present on step one. And now I would like to discuss with you um, step two of phase three. Um, so. Uh, Really, I would like to see whether you've had any um, issues in using the enterprise development template that is contained in the in the guidelines, and whether you actually used it and how did you use it with um, with the entrepreneurs, just to, to get a little bit of your experiences in this particular in this particular very important step. Was there perhaps a part that you find found very difficult, something that was quite easy for the facilitators to pass on to the entrepreneurs? Um, interested to hear about your experiences and stories. Mm, Kat, huh? Yes, please, Grace. Yeah, mine is not a experience, but I'm trying to think. When I joined my organization, I found that they, they started to develop all the enterprise development plan. But the way you have explained it, it seems that it's the role of producers themselves to come out and develop their enterprise develop such document. But the way I see my producers there, it's like a, a bit tricky for them, if they can go around those questions, the, the important questions that we have shown, to come out with the document that can really help them. So I was trying to think, is it possible for producers to have maybe a consultant and explain to him or her what they want to do? 
and maybe to show the data, the information that they've already collected. Based on them, the one we as technology to go within all aspects, maybe to answer those important questions about the risk management, profitability, and all of those kind of questions can support them to come up with a real or the something, the, the document that you will really sound well, and whoever can read it can be interested or can find a motive behind to support to support them. Thank you, Grace. That's a very important and interesting question. And I would like to perhaps make a first reaction and then ask also um, Isabel or um, or 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 Jacques um, to come in. Um, so perhaps a question back to you, Grace. Um, so if the the enterprise development plan is prepared for the entrepreneurs by an external consultant. Um, I mean, we all understand that the world changes constantly and and uh, and we will all have to adapt our strategies and however we go about life to the changing environment around us. And that same is true for an entrepreneur um, and the, the 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 market that they um, that they operate in, but not just the market, the 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 environment, the the legal environment, um, the social environment. So there will be constantly changes to reflect on and adapt um, adapt your business strategy, your enterprise strategy to these changes. Um, so uh, I just I just would like to sort of trigger your um, your reflections on this and how how could this spend then. Um, be done by an entrepreneur who might not understand what is actually his or her business about what are the different elements in it and how do they function if they do not if they do not yeah. if they are the ones preparing it themselves yeah my thinking is that 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 uh, the person to write for them will not be somewhere else he or she has to visit them they give him or her the finding that they've, the data they've collected in phase two, and he can ask further to know maybe how, what they anticipate or whatever, based on the data that they've collected in, in phase two, he can support them. My idea is that to get someone who can support them to come up with a proper document that can be presented even to a donor or to whoever who wants to support them. Because the way I see the, the understanding, you know, it's like the tricky. If you go to um, a mere farmer, maybe with the lowest level of education, and you want to him or her to like to explain the issue of profit or, or how much to produce it, trying to project something that she or he has not started some sort of a tricky that's what I, I'm trying to doubt if we, maybe we can, we let it to be done by producers themselves we can end up with heavy document that cannot be presented in a way okay. uh, I can see Isabel has unmuted herself please yeah <laughs> Um, yeah, it's it's a, it's a very uh, key key aspect that you you mentioned now, but uh, let's say uh, for sure there are situations where the people themselves cannot do alone their their, their document, but uh, and and uh, what we have seen in 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 real world is that uh, there is always somebody being their children, being their neighbors, being somebody of the local community or of the women's group or who is more educated than others or even who knows how to write and read and, and count, although the producers themselves cannot do it. And that would help them to go through the document and record whatever the local people will have mentioned. That means they, they, they will uh, ask the right question in their own language. And, and actually, it's also the role of the facilitator. 
but the facilitator can uh, train some uh, people who are from the local community, but not the, the potential entrepreneurs themselves. And together they will develop this document. Uh, it, it's very rare that uh, if it is somebody from outside that they will follow up on during a long time and be there to, to, to adapt. If it is somebody from the local community, young ones, most of the time it's, it's some children like teenagers or uh, who, who help their parents to, to go through that. So that whenever they have to change later on, they know where it is, they know what question to ask, they have the, the information also available to them. So that's what I wanted to, to add. Thank you, Isabel. That was um, that was a very good. I agree. Yeah. Yes, please, Jack. I actually agree with what Isabel said. Okay, it has to be the local people, otherwise they will be lost on the longer term. And uh, but I think also it is really the role of the facilitator to uh, support the entrepreneurs, the future entrepreneurs to fill up this EDP or to understand what is the EDP and to make it. Even if it is not well done, that's not a problem. Then later, you can ask to someone, okay, a consultant or whoever you want, to reorganize the EDP as it should be done to present to donors or to whoever. That's another story, okay? But the background should be done by the local people. And, and uh, of course, the EDP format that is mentioned in the document, it's just uh, a format, okay? So you follow it, you fill up the document, but each country has their own way to present an EDP. So you have also to adjust with the country, okay, uh, demand. But really, as Isabel said, we have to start from the villages so that later on they can follow up. Thank you. Can I ask just a, a small point? Yes, uh, and to, to, to come back to what Jacques said, is that in the document, of course, you have one format, but uh, uh, one format cannot uh, adapt to all the, the circumstances. If you have a very uh, small enterprise with, with very simple uh, product, not so, so, so much uh, technology, etc. You can also uh, simplify a lot your, your uh, EDP format for them so that it becomes also more user friendly for your local people. But you can have also next to the, 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 the very small enterprises, another enterprise who will be more uh, medium scale uh, processing unit. And then you adapt again your EDP to a more sophisticated type of enterprise. So this is the role of the of the um, project team or M and D team to 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 prepare this kind of thing before uh, meeting the local people. Yeah. Thank you, Isabel. Thank you, Jacques. Um, just quickly, Oscar, I just wanted to double check that um, this answer was sufficient for Grace. It is okay. Now I understand, but that the background information we can, the mice come from the producers. And if they want to get maybe donors, whatever, is now they can involve the consultant to make the, the their document to be readable according to the need of the donor. Maybe at their level now it's good for them to develop their document. Thank you. Thank you, Grace. Please, Oscar, the floor is yours. Yeah, I, I just uh, I wanted to comment on the question by Grace. Um, the, she's asking whether it can be done by an external consultant or by the group members themselves. But I think the role of the MAD team is to guide the process, just guide the process and guide the group. Uh, in Kenya, we consider the, the entire the entire MAD process as, as a toolkit. And so we'll always try to make it very simple for the for the group members or the FFPOs to understand <clears throat> the various concepts. 
So we, normally we have a session to agree on what to use and what not to use in the MAD tool. Yeah, we, we normally agree with, when we are planning our trainings with the Edwin and, 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 and Wanyama and the rest of the team members, we, we, we have to have a prayer meeting and we agree on what we really need to use uh, for the members to understand this process. Uh, then two, the danger of using an external consultant is that the consultant may do a very difficult question that the members may not understand. That is, a, that is the, normally the problem of external consultants. They may do a very difficult document uh, that the members may not understand and fully own. So for us to create ownership, we involve the members as much as possible in those simple activities, data collection, uh, interacting with, with market actors, that helps them also to understand the enterprise and how it is and how they can improve it. Then in those questions that, uh, that um, Kata put across in those many circles, yeah, in the previous slide, one thing that we normally do there in Kenya is that this is the moment for us also to ask ourselves, how can the enterprise groups interact with the value chain actors? Yeah, the interaction with value chain actors at that level. So we ask ourselves, which, which are the critical value chain act actors that we need to bring on board so that uh, they start interacting from a very, very early stage of the enterprise development plan. I mean, early stage of developing this plan. So we, we, we think about who should we bring on board? Who is important? Who is critical? So that they also come and share this information with their members and tell them, this is how the enterprise is behaving. Uh, this is what we look for. These are the quality standards that we need. So that is a very critical question. Also, we have to ask in, 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 in that stage, which is the most critical question about the actors. Because when you bring in the actors too late, also it creates a problem of trust among them and the, and, and the enterprise uh, members and the members of the enterprise group. So those are my two quick comments. Thank That's, you very much. It, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Oscar. Yes, indeed. Um, I just wanted to comment on your second point about the the creating those connections with the value chain actors. I, I, I mean, ideally, this already happens before the enterprise development plan is formulated, and it's an important part of the data collection in phase two. Um, Tang, please. Yes, thank you, Shata. Is this a very quick? Um... Uh, observation and uh, discussion on uh, EDP uh, preparation. Yes, when we work with the uh, entrepreneurs and MAPLs, we following EDP uh, format in MAND document and just uh, help them to fill in. And uh, through, work, uh, through, through working with them, we realize that it's a very interesting and really a learning process. Yes. Uh, like uh, we practice uh, all the step in uh, phase uh, one and phase two, where the MAPOs uh, can uh, uh, discuss and uh, describe uh, their products, uh, identify uh, the competitors and set the price and all of how uh, they, they can discuss how to market their products and they assign uh, each other who to do what. And uh, through um, uh, support them, we uh, had one thing. Uh, I think um, we should uh, do more or maybe uh, we can assess each other cash flow. Actually, this is the one we, um, we have to spend a lot of time to support for the MFPOs uh, to do it. As you know that uh, most of the MFPOs, they are most of them are farmers, and the, the highest uh, education of them is uh, uh, high school only. Very rarely, uh, uh, MFPOs uh, they they have uh, someone who uh, graduated from college or university, so it means that they don't have a background on accounting. So it takes a lot of time, and sometimes after working with them, we, we don't feel the, uh, happy. Sometimes we, we feel unexpected. It's, it's quite com complicated uh, for them. So therefore, in this uh, training, uh, I would like to propose that 
uh, if possible, um, the expert uh, from FAO, like uh, Isabel, Sophie, or Zoli, or even Gata, can uh, help us to review again the, the cash flow to make it uh, as simple as possible. And maybe uh, through this uh, training, we also would like to hear more about other countries, how they can support MFPOs or entry trainers to prepare the cash flow. Thank you. Thank you, Tang. So you're saying that um, um, the, the most difficult calculation is, is around the cash flow analysis. And admittedly, it is the most, the most complex calculation. Um, and you're saying that perhaps the guidance in the toolkit is very good um, all for the process, but for the cash flow analysis, there could be some more clarity on that. So perhaps we could also go through it today so that um already the people who are present here will will um will hear some clarifications if you have any questions now but um um yes i'm just wondering because we have an hour left and i think it would be quite good if we could look at some of the calculations um shall we move to that and then um hopefully have some more time for questions later on or even tomorrow morning um Okay, let me see where I am in my slides. So I can see there is a lively conversation going on between Oscar and Tuan. That's great. <laughs> well, let me share my screen again. Um, where are we? Yeah. Okay, can you see my screen? So um, in step two of phase for the entrepreneurs um, will do all of the financial calculations and the, um, I just, sorry, again, this is only in English, but this is just a sort of overview of all the different types of calculations and how they all fit together and, and, and the outcome of one will influence the other. So it's just to, to, to show this in a graphic. Um, but the very first thing that the entrepreneurs should figure out is the size of um, their enterprise. So to have a first guess of what, uh, what are the minimum quantities that they will have to produce, um, in which market um, they will sell their products, so which trader, uh, shop, final buyer, the selling price and the quantity for each market so that they will earn enough money to fulfill the financial expectations that they have expressed in phase one. Um, and um, these calculations are really only to get an approximate figure. And as with all of the, the steps and calculations, um, first it's a little bit of guessing, and then it becomes more and more concrete as you continue in the calculations of the different, the different aspects. Um, so, <clears throat> so this is really just to get an approximate figure to uh, estimate the quantity and the selling prices the new enterprises will produce. So in other words, it will help to help to figure out the size of the enterprise. Um, so how do you do that? How do you roughly estimate the size of an enterprise and the market share it will take? Um, so first of all, there is a decision on where the entrepreneur wants to position him or herself in the market chain. And um, they will first calculate the average buying and selling price at each level of the market chain, um, the average quantities traded and sold at each level um, of the market chain, the transportation costs, the packing needed and their costs. And this will help them to decide within the market chain to whom the entrepreneur will sell the product. So for this, the following criteria are important. Where is this market located? So is it easy to reach what will be the price of the cost of transportation to the market, the selling price, um, the uh, how difficult it is to reach the quality that is required in that particular market, um, and the quantity of the demand um, in this particular market. So um, they will then estimate the profit per unit of the selected product. And there is, this is a sort of rough um, guidance on how they should go about calculating how much profit they will be able to make on a, on a particular product 
And it really depends on what type of enterprise they're looking at. Is, is it if they're producers and traders, um, they need to divide the unit selling price by two um, to give them a rough estimate. Again, this is just a rough estimate of the of the um the profit they will make per unit of um of this product sold. So in this example, um, the unit selling price for one liter of honey is 12,000 Tanzanian shillings. So if they are trading honey, they will be able to expect around 6,000 Tanzanian shilling in profit per per unit, uh, per liter, sorry. Um, if there are, however, if the enterprise is based on value additioning and processing, um, they should divide this not by two, but by three, um, or calculate two fifths of the unit selling price. So in this example, the selling price is 15,000, then the profit per unit would be 5,000 or 6,000, depending on whether you take one third or two fifths. Um, So then um, a decision on the size of the, of the enterprise. Um, so to really estimate the production quantity required to, to meet the expected income that you want, you have set for yourself as, a, as a, the entrepreneurs have set for themselves as a goal, um, they will need to take um, their financial objective and divide it by the estimated profit per unit, which we've just calculated in the step before. So if this entrepreneur had decided that they would like to um, have an overall extra income from their enterprise to their household income of 2.2 million Tanzanian shilling, they need to divide this by the 6,000 Tanzanian shilling that they've just calculated as the price, uh, the profit um, per unit. Um, they will get, and this brings them to 366 liters. So they will have to produce at least 366 liters of honey um, to be able to achieve their financial objectives set for the enterprise. <clears throat> so then um, based on this, they will be able to estimate how much of the market share they will take. Um, so they take the required production per month. So, um, uh, this is what we've just calculated before, and divide this by the estimated total um, um, demand in, in their markets that they're, that they're uh, envisaging to, to sell in. Um, and they will have done um, previous rough estimates of this demand. Um, so in this case, they would divide the 360 liters by 12,000. So this is the, this is the, the demand, the, um, um, in their in the product in the market that they are aiming for, so they will calculate um, through this that they will approximately take a market share of three percent. And um, this is just also to to understand that um, taking a bigger market share is not necessarily a good thing, as um, it is quite a risky thing. You need to you need to uh, you have many competitors, you need to displace many competitors, and it requires a lot of strategizing. So the thumb rule is that um, taking up to 10% of the market share is something that is, is still feasible to small entrepreneurs. Is there anything that... Yes, please, Oscar, I've seen your hand up. Yeah, normally we advise that uh, let, let them start small and grow the business. They should not choose, they, they should not take too much that they cannot chew. So they, they, they should uh, grow it small, take up a, a portion of the market share and grow that one gradually into what they, they want it to be. Because that also gives them an opportunity to, to know the market, to understand it better, to know the challenges, you have to know where they, to intervene and what support they need in the process. So it's good when they start small and then they grow the business yeah, uh, gradually. Uh, thank that, you. that is very important. Yes, thank Can you. I answer? Yes, please, Jack. Okay, I agree with you eh, completely. That's good and good, uh, good information. But now we are working on the calculation and trying to size an enterprise. So we try to size this as big as we can do. And then later on, okay, when we do our EDP, we can say, okay, now we are going to work the first year on a small scale and improve slowly, second year, increase, increase, increase. But our target is this. Am I clear? So 
now we are we are speaking on what is the definitive target we can say of the enterprise and now you are speaking about the strategy how to reach this target and i agree the strategy is very good we have to start small and increase slowly 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 i hope it's clear for you thank you thank you jack thank you oscar um are there any other questions on this particular calculation uh what what we have to be very clear also it will be what are the activities of the enterprise that means that has to be clearly decided among the promoters we can say of the enterprise exactly what they will be doing what this enterprise will be doing just to give you an example <clears throat> i'm speaking about honey because it's the first that comes in my mind huh? but in honey there are different things in the process of or we can say in the honey business that is one is producing the honey from the honey bees okay the and the second one is to process the honey. That means to extract the honey. Then the third one is to pack, then to sell. Let's just concentrate on this. So now we have to, the enterprise has to decide if it does the, we can say, produce the honey, process the honey, pack the honey, and sell it. If the enterprise decides to do like this, at that time, the honey bees, okay, or the honey, you can say uh, house, I forgot how we say, okay, will belong to the enterprise and they will not belong to the farmers. I don't know if I am clear. So this, you have to be very careful not to mix all this. So if the enterprise does only the packing, for example, at that time, the enterprise become a packing enterprise. And not honey processing. We have to see also the enterprise can do the processing. So if the enterprise does the processing at that time, it needs to have the tools to process and it will buy the raw material from the producer themselves. But the producer will not be involved in the enterprise directly. That will be, there will be only people who will sell the raw material to the enterprise. So all this, I think, has to be clearly, clearly decided at the really beginning when the people think about the type of enterprise they are going to do. Thank you, Jacques. Yes, I guess it's a, it was a, a very good um, description and example of what I mentioned at the beginning of um, when I started talking about the how to decide on the market, how to calculate the market share, is that... Um, you, the, the entrepreneurs really look at the the entire market chain and then take a decision on where in that market chain which position they will want to take um so what the enterprise is actually going to be about is this um is this what you wanted to illustrate jack can i add a little bit something? yes if you go back to the uh, honey story okay honey business if the enterprise does not do, or we can say produce the honey, at that time, the honey producer has to do their small EDP for their business. For their, at that time, they become a producing enterprise and they can do a small EDP for each of them for their own business. And there will be a bigger, we can say EDP, for the enterprise itself that will be processing or packing or whatever. Okay, thank you. Are there any questions on, on what Jack just said? Or any reactions? Please, Isabel, yes. Yeah, just, just uh, I, I want to add on this and, and to, to insist that it is very important because we have seen so many projects where uh, out of not clarity about this, uh, the, the, the raw material suppliers are considered as a kind of part of the enterprise, but they are not. So, uh, and, and that means uh, most of the time they are 
impose a, 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 a rate, uh, etc., without themselves thinking, is it a good business for me? So uh, it is important to have to, to see the, the the point of view of each of the com components of the uh, uh, chain. That means those who will who will do the processing becomes an enterprise, and they make their uh, enterprise profile an EDP for their enterprise. But the the other who, who supply to the enterprise also it should be a small enterprise which is profitable and and uh, 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 environmentally uh, friendly, et cetera, too. So it, it, it's very good if they can do themselves their small uh, enterprise and their small EDP on that. And, and sometimes they may, they may find that it's not so profitable for them. So th this is a very important point, which are, has been sources of problem in many projects, actually, not clarifying on that. Okay, can, um, can I add something? Yes? Please, Jack, yes, please. Yes. <laughs> yes, yes, I can hear Okay, that does not mean that the producer of raw material, let's say the honeybees, okay, produce the, the, the raw material, uh, are not involved in the processing company. That means they can be involved as, let's say, as a shareholder. They can invest their money in the or as a cooperative or whatever, okay. And then at that time they can also get profit from this enterprise that will be processing the honey or packing or I don't know if I am clear, okay. Yeah. It's very important to discuss all these possibilities together with all the actors, or we can say all the people who will be involved in the process or in the enterprise. Okay, thank you very much, Isabel and Jack. Any comments or questions perhaps on this still? Mm. Next one. Yeah, thank you, Kata. Thank you, uh, uh, Isabel and with Jack uh, uh, gave us some advice for us. And I agree that the farmers should decide what they like, will do in the supply chain in each uh, um, point of supply chain or what product to make in particular market segment according to the capacity and expectation of each FFPO is very important. No need to do all of thing, only uh, one, one thing or two things depends on each um, capacity of FFPO. And uh, in Vietnam, at this stage, it, it takes a lot of time uh, and at the, at the um, first uh, time when we training about MND in Vietnam, the time of the training course was not enough for make, uh, support uh, thing, uh, making EDP. And, um, uh, and uh, after the training, uh, after the time of the training course, um, during, uh, we, we have to work with uh, FFPO uh, at home. Uh, um, to to support for them and during EDP preparation time we asked uh, facilitate ask many questions to assist FFPO to consider carefully and make a specific EDP and um, um, I remember Mr. Tham also have a photo of us and the FFPO working until midnight <laughs> and at that time there was all even also a power artist, but FFPOs are still passionate about doing EDP. And um, in fact, these tech farmers often miss out on a lot of information. For example, maybe labor or maybe a small material for, for, for the processing pro product. And therefore, EDP does not include own cost in the production process nor doesn't it take uh, into account risks according to five groups of factors. And um, although when training on MAND, farmers still do not want to change and still discard planning according to the old way of production. Okay, facilitator team let the farmer do it. And after that, when working together to create a business, uh, to create EDP, the farmer come up with reasons that surprise them. 
that is in Bacca province, if any household has a forest located more than one kilometer away from the road, farmer will not be profitable after five years of forestation. Yeah. And um, when uh, FFPO sees the uh, EDP, okay, I understand now. I, 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 we will discuss uh, together and find a new idea and make a new ADP. So uh, that's a, a small story when we're working with farmers in Bakan province. Thank you, Kata. Thank you, Tuan, for sharing this story. Very, very, always very interesting and good to hear about different countries' experiences. And it looks like you had some really, sounds like you had some very enthusiastic entrepreneurs working in the darkness. <laughs> um, um, yes, so unless there are any other questions on this particular point now that we've just discussed, I uh, would like to move on and um, ask the group, um, um, sorry, so, um, mm -mm -mm, where am I in my script? Sorry. <laughs> mm. ah, such an interesting story term. Um, so now the trainees have an idea of the size of their enterprise, the, the product they will do, the, the selling price, et cetera. And they can do accurate calculations um, that will allow them to know the profitability, the investment costs, the cash needed during the first months and years, the need for a loan, the costs of to run the enterprise, et cetera, according to the estimation they had done while figuring out the size of the enterprise. So during this process, they will adjust prices and quantities, um, investments, machinery, packing, in order to make the business idea really feasible. So this is a really um, flexible process where there is a lot of going back and forth to adjust numbers to, to then come up in the end with, with a plan that, that is solid. So one of the, uh, the, and these calculations should be done in order because they will, the, the result of one calculation will feed into the result of the next calculation. So one of the first things that the entrepreneur should, should understand, what are their fixed assets? And I wanted to understand whether, um, I want, wanted to know whether you could perhaps, one of you could perhaps tell me quickly what, what fixed assets are. Please, Mahangi, welcome. Thank you. Uh, these are, uh goods that we buy in order to help us undertake the activity and that we're going to use over a number of years. Thank you, Rangi. Yes, yeah, so fixed assets are all the equipment um, that are needed to run the enterprise at full capacity. Um, and the participants should, oh, sorry, the, the entrepreneur should really do a full detailed list of all the equipment and fixed assets they will need to run their business um, at full capacity and then cost each item. Um, I think that is quite an easy calculation so far. Um, so I'm going to jump to the next one. So what can would I be just, the... Can I just add one thing? Yes, please. Okay. Practically, if you want to help the people to find what are the small equipment they need, the machinery, the building, and all this, you should help them to start from the really beginning, that means from the raw material, and to describe what they are going to do exactly, okay, on the time-wise, with this raw material to end up with the finished product. And they, they note all the equipment they need, everything, everything, everything. They come with a long list, okay? With, they should not forget anything. Then at that time, to do this, you may do a group of, okay, the entrepreneurs or the people who are interested to work in it, and each of them can participate. That will help you also to understand and to see if the group you are working with is really aware of what he wants to do because you will see that maybe they forget some small equipment or they forget some machineries or they forget so few things then you realize okay they want to do something but they are not sure already about it so they should work again on okay what are the machinery or equipment they need 
Thank you, Jacques. Yes, that's a very important addition. Okay. Um, so now, um, once the fixed assets are determined, um, um, there will there are some fixed costs that that the entrepreneurs will have to calculate. And I was wondering again whether someone from the group could volunteer to tell us about what fixed costs are. What would you count under the fixed costs? Jacques, is your hand up? Did you want to say something? Perhaps not. Please, Jean-Marc. My hand is not up. Okay, yes. not yet. maybe later. Yes. Okay. Please, Jean-Marc, please. Oui, bonjour. C'est les profits spéciaux. Good morning. Le comme le téléphone, téléphone internet, le salaire de moins le salaire mensuel, such as le opérateur, machiniste. Uh, I'm sorry, it's not clear. His uh, internet is really great. But he gave an Thank example that um, I got hold of is uh, internet cost, for example. Okay, um, thank you, Jean-Marc. Unfortunately, we, we couldn't hear everything that you were saying. We heard internet costs, for example. Um, is, is there perhaps someone else who could, who could add? Maybe if you switch your camera off, um, Jean-Marc, we could hear you better. There is a lot of wind in your microphone. Would you like to add something, Jean-Marc? No. No, it's still uh, it's not audible. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm afraid it's not, we can't really hear what you were saying. Perhaps you could type it in the chat if it's if that's possible. Otherwise, perhaps someone else from the group who could talk to us about um, what fixed costs are. Yes, please, Wahangi. Oui, alors, uh, les coûts fixes. Uh, so the fixed donc, cost les dépenses, uh, represent uh, expenditure uh, that is going to be incurred in the course of the activity, activity. either, uh, for example, uh, in, in the whole year. That means there is going to be different compte, donc, costs that are going to be incurred. Uh, pendant la réalisation de l'activité, y compris les amortissements des investissements que, so this que nous avons effectués au départ that pour we, pouvoir uh, faire l'activité. In order je to undertake si je the activities, I don't know whether this is clear. Yes, I think there is one important point about fixed costs, and that is um, the fixed costs are those costs that have to be paid every month or every year at full capacity, whatever the quantity of the product is that you're producing. So I'm just going to give you, um, so examples of this would be the salary for permanent staff. So a manager, for example, someone who's always um, employed in the enterprise, no matter how what the, what the production level is at that moment. It's things like insurance. It's things like fixed taxes for the company, not on your revenues, but on the for the company itself. And as uh, Wahangi said, it's your yearly depreciation. And I'm going to come to that now. Um, sorry, in a bit. <laughs> Sorry, Jean-Marc, we cannot hear you very well. Um, 
Non, c'est déjà donné, par exemple. C'est déjà, déjà, déjà dit. Pour les coûts euh, coût fixes. Uh, I think he was saying something with regard to the fixed cost, but we still can't get it. I don't know whether he's written something in the chat. Okay, let me see the chat. Um, Nothing. No, okay. Um, right. Okay. Uh, I'm very sorry for that. I, I, ho I hope you can still follow what we're saying at least. Um, so this is um, uh, a, an example of a table to calculate the fixed costs. I think that's fairly straightforward. Um, so we talked about the yearly um, uh, depreciation. Um, so I was just wondering again whether someone perhaps could explain to us what that actually means. And why is it important to calculate this? Wahangi, well, I can see your lovely smile. Would you like to, to tell us? Oui, donc euh, l'amortissement euh, yes. annuel, donc c'est uh, c'est la dépréciation, dépréciation des matériels qui ont été investis et ça représente donc euh, l'argent qu'on doit mettre de côté tous les ans pour pouvoir to, renouveler uh, ces, ces matériels. So Wonderful, that's that's perfect. Yes, so it's the money that you should put aside every year to buy new equipment once the, the existing gets too old or it needs to be repaired. Um, so this should be also detailed by all the, the entrepreneurs. It should be a detailed list of, of, um, of uh, the full, the fixed costs at full capacity and the fixed costs will include also the depreciation costs. Um, and then um, there is something very similar around uh, um, maintenance and repair. But wait, can I just interfere? Yes, please. I go okay. back. Mm -hmm. But no. Uh, what What is very interesting when we do this together with the entrepreneurs, the future entrepreneurs, is that uh, we can see if they know exactly what type of machinery or equipment they are going to use, because they have to decide about what is the lifespan of the equipment. And usually they discuss a lot to know exactly what is the lifespan of the equipment they are using. For example, uh, I don't know, if they have an equipment to process, uh, I don't know, honey or to extract honey, then they should know how long this extractor will last. And then when you facilitate the discussion, you will see if they understand what they are going to do or not. Okay, thank you. It's the same more or less for the maintenance. Miss Isabel, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I, I want to say that uh, for for maybe uh, medium scale industry or there, there is a, um, uh, in, in every country, uh, the, the, the government also uh, have a fixed list of uh, uh, for example, for, for uh, buildings, uh, you have to count 20 years for depreciation. Uh, for, uh, let's say, uh, trucks or cars, it will be 10 years. So they have themselves a scale of, uh, uh, for, for depreciation. So it can be useful to just adopt the national uh, uh, model for that, uh, which is not true for small equipment, of course. That's all. Thank you, Isabel. Yes. So then, um, yeah, there's something similar around maintenance and repair and the, the calculation of the costs for this. So this is um, a way to also save money every year to be able to repair and maintain um, the small and big equipment, the buildings, etc. And there is usually a percentage rate that you could use. Um, 
and you, this could also be adjusted to your as you like and according to your personal experience um, but it's just making sure that you have enough funds every year to repair and maintain your equipment so for buildings this would be one percent of the cost of the building that you calculate every year as a fixed costs um, for big equipment and machinery it would be five percent or thereabouts and for small equipment ten percent of the of the cost itself the buying price of it okay um, so then we come to variable costs, and I've already given it away here, but I just would like to, again, ask the group whether you could perhaps talk to us about what, what, is, what, are, what are variable costs, what is the difference between variable and fixed costs? Perhaps someone else in Wahangi. I can, I can. No, no, I was just saying perhaps someone else. Perhaps, I was just saying perhaps someone else. It's always me, yes. Maybe somebody else. Le son est très mauvais. Donc, le coût variable, les coûts variables sont les coûts. Euh, Lié donc euh, à la production euh, uh, the costs that are linked to production. Euh, des produits et qui sont variables, c'est-à-dire qui ne sont pas tout le temps, euh, qui, qui ne sont pas dans les coûts fixes de l'entreprise. <laughs> And why are they variable? That, um, what, what are they? they what makes the variation? In, uh, the uh, fixed Next. cost of the enterprise. So the, the variable cost, perhaps um, just to move along a little bit, um, the variable costs are related to the quantity that you produce. So they will change dependent on how much you will produce. So things like um, transportation, how many trucks will you need? How many bicycle rounds, did, how many rounds on the bicycle did you need, will you need to, to transport the product? Um, how much packaging material will you need? Um, what is going to be the salary of staff that you will need to employ when it's the picking season for that particular fruit you're going to process? So these are all costs that will change with the quantities that you will produce in that season. That's why they're called variable costs. So again, all the entrepreneurs should do a very detailed list of all the variable costs Uh, and this again, as Jacques was mentioning, in terms of the fixed costs, this will this will have to be. I mean, this will have to be produced with a very good understanding of how the the whole operation is going to work and what will be the individual requirements um, and the costs associated with them. That will depend on how much you produce. Um, okay, is this clear? Is there perhaps a question on this? If we were in a classroom, I would now say, let's all get up and jump around five times because I feel like this is <laughs> we've all quietened down a lot. But unfortunately, I cannot do that. Anyway, um, so <clears throat> can't come up with a joke <laughs> just right now either. Okay, so let's move then. Um, so here uh, is a calculation of the yearly income. And that the yearly incomes are the total money the enterprise will get within a year after selling all its products. So what is important to note here that this is not the profit. This is the revenue, the income. So here I've put an example table and I would like everyone who does not understand the table to raise their hand now. Now is the opportunity to ask questions on this. But essentially, uh, the entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneurs will list the different products and they may produce different products or they may be involved in, in different products. Um, they will list the quantity that they will um, produce that year 
and they will list the selling price that they have decided for that. Um, and then they will, sorry, let me get my pointer so I can show you where I am. And then they will multiply the quantity with the selling price and they will come up with a number and they will do that for all the products that they will their enterprise will handle. And at the end, at the bottom, add all of these numbers they have calculated to come up with a total income per year if they sell everything. Is that clear? Or is there someone who would like some clarification or perhaps Jacques Isabel to add? I think I think I think it does not require more. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> it's okay, yeah. I think it's all right, no problem. Sorry? It's okay. Okay. So let me see where I am now. What comes next? So this is then the calculation of the yearly profit. Very interesting. So here um, the yearly profit represents the money that the owner can actually keep. Um so it should be around, that would be ideal. Um, what the entrepreneurs have calculated or uh, expressed in phase one as their, their objective, their financial objective for the enterprise. Um, if it's not, um, then the entrepreneur with, the, with support of the facilitator will have to find ways to reduce the costs or increase the production or um, reduce the scale of their expected income. So reduce their expectations a little bit. Um, so they could, for example, decide to sell to another marketplace or um, uh, reduce the transportation costs in some way or building construction costs. And rather than building, a, building uh, new buildings, uh, rent buildings in the beginning, so try to see how they can adjust the different costs um, and the different elements in their calculations done so far to achieve a profit that will match their expectation. Mm -hmm. And let me find my pointer again. So here's a very simple table. Um, they will add up the yearly fixed costs and the yearly variable costs. These will be the yearly total costs. And they will have their total yearly income, which we've calculated before. So the yearly profit is your yearly income minus the yearly fixed and variable costs added together. Any questions or comments? Are we doing in time? Still have 15 minutes. Please, Wahangi. Oui, merci. Well, euh, maintenant much. que nous avons donc euh, calculé uh, le profit annuel de l'entreprise, euh, nous avons toujours l'habitude d'aller de, de, voir est-ce que ça correspond check aux besoins euh, que nous avons défini au départ pour pouvoir améliorer donc les conditions de vie des producteurs. Et c'est une démarche systématique au sein de nos OP pour voir si l'entreprise créée peut vraiment répondre à ses besoins. Voilà, c'est ce que j'avais à dire. Yes, thank you. I think that's really important, Rohangi, because otherwise there is no point of an enterprise because it will require lots of investment in terms of time, resources, etc. But if it does not match the, the objectives um, of, the, of the entrepreneurs, there's no point in pursuing that particular enterprise idea um, or they need to change how they, they set up the business. Um, I saw Jacques hand up, but I also see Oscars. Um, okay. Oscar, would um, you like to come in and then Jack? Uh, oh, thank you, thank you, Kata. Uh, normally, when we are discussing fixed costs and variable costs, uh, I normally use very simple examples and very practical examples from day to day, to day life. So you normally will ask the group members, uh, uh, how often do you buy your your shoes, for example? You know, and uh, 
Then if you buy a new shoe today, how long will it take you to replace it? So those are, or if you buy a new blanket or a new mattress today, you know, how long will it take you to replace your mattress? So we, we use very simple practical issues uh, so that they may understand the bigger issues. So you have to start very simple to explain that if you buy a machine today, after some time, it will, it will, it will get worn out and you will need to replace it because it, it will be very expensive, for example, to maintain it, or it may break down completely and that is going to slow down. It will make sure that your production process comes to a halt. So we explain those things using very simple analogies that as a human being, you're not going to put on one shoe forever or, or one, one pair of clothes forever. For, you, you have to change them at some time. And that creates an understanding uh, between, between uh, the, the, the group members that uh, there, there, there are some of those items that they have suggested to use, if, even if they are machines and all that, these machines will be old. They will need some, uh, some costs to maintain them. They'll need some costs to run them. So that you have to create that connection between the group members and, and their day-to-day -day life. So that, that creates a very good understanding between them. So, because somebody may ask, ah, will they understand what a fixed cost is or a variable cost is? If you go directly and say this is a, a fixed cost, they'll not understand. But if you go uh, and ask them from very practical life experiences, they'll tell you, ah, when I buy, when I buy my, my, for example, uh, there are simple tools you use at home. And then you ask them, after how long are you going to replace this tool? It could be a machete, a panga, you know? It could be a wheelbarrow, you know? And, and from that, they'll come to understand that eventually this machine becomes obsolete and you have to replace it and you have to get a new one. So that's, that's how we do it sometimes, very, using very simple practical examples. Thank you very much. Thank you, Oscar. That's a very, very good advice, I think, um, to, to use very practical, relatable examples to, to do these calculations. I can see Iwan's hand up. Please, Ivan, we cannot hear you. No, we still cannot hear you. Hello? Yes, now we can, yes, now we can hear you. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Yakata. We think that the early profit, uh, uh, we uh, agree with you in general. But uh, now we saw some problems from the early profits and calculation, how we have to uh, foresee this. Because the, sometimes the FAPO uh, have the, uh, they have to borrow money from uh, bank for um, for buying material is uh, belong of uh, variable cost and they know about the interest of uh, bank they have to pay uh, for, for example after a year or six months they can calculate and they have to calculate in the uh, another expenditure in the uh, yearly uh, variable cost but we have another case when they uh, they they sell their material and product for uh, other stakeholder in uh, value chain or for distributor. At the beginning, maybe they will pay uh, the money uh, back for our FAPO uh, very on time. But now we have some uh, cases, cases that the enterprise or the distributor or retailer Sometimes they pay back uh, uh, the the the, the uh, money for our FAPO very late, maybe after six months. Even in the uh, contract, they uh, they said that they will uh, uh, pay back after one month. But sometimes they will pay back uh, for uh, uh, later than three months or six months, and in some cases, very long time when they pay back. Did in uh, did uh, also uh, influence to the profits of FAPO. This is why when we have our FAPO, we only uh, we very concerned about how oh, they can negotiate with the buyer 
on the contract uh, uh, selling or contract uh, distribution. And we also advise our SFPO if um, uh, as a first uh, uh, transfer of product, they do not uh, get the cost uh, back from uh, buyer. Maybe we have to consider in the second time but even in, in the second time, if they do not pay back immediately after two months or three months, we have to stop because it's a very uh, rich uh, cases. If after six months, they do not pay back uh, at all, sometimes almost our profit of FPO uh, will <laughs> uh, broken and maybe sometimes we have very rich, yes. This is the uh, happened in our FAPO in Vietnam. That, this is why I think that we have to very carefully when we work with the retailer and distributor and very concerned, maybe after one transfer or after two transfer, if they do not pay back totally, maybe we have to stop. Yes. Thank you, Yvonne. And I, I think there are two points there that, um, three points perhaps that, that can be learned or that um, could be deducted from what your, your, your experiences. And first of all, is that um, before you start um, implementing your activities, you will, you will have all of the different strategies in your enterprise development plan. And in this case, in the risk management strategy, you should consider the risk that some of your buyers may break their contractual agreements. And so they, the entrepreneurs should really, right from the beginning, um, have potential solutions identified in this case. Um, and the second point is that um, I think the cash flow analysis is a really important tool in that. And that would be the next thing that we'd talk about. And I think we're going to talk about it tomorrow morning to give it enough time and mental resources. But it's a very useful tool for the entrepreneurs to understand um, if all goes well and according to the contracts, um, how much money will they have to play with at the end of each month? And will they actually be able to to, to invest whatever is needed in the, in the second month in, into their production? Or will they face cash shortages at, in the first three to six months and will actually be inoperable? And the third point I've just forgotten. Oh, no. So, yes, the, the third one point was that um, that sort of highlights also what Isabel was talking about yesterday around the, the flexibility and, and adaptability and what you just said, Yvonne, and also that if you see that after a couple of months, things are not working well for whatever reason, you need to change strategy, adapt your strategy to the changing situation. I could see Isabel wanting to make a comment. No, okay. Um, Can I just add one thing? Yes, please. Yes, okay. So uh, this yearly profit, okay, it just, an an idea it gives you to do this calculation gives you an idea there may be many other problems okay later but that at a certain time when the company will be running at full capacity we may earn this money and what is important for the entrepreneurs is that they realize that if they enter into this process at the end of each year okay this money will come to them and then we are in really concrete, concrete thing. Now, people can imagine or can realize, okay, I produce one ton of tomato. I will sell in this place. So I will earn this money. And then it's concrete. That's just what I wanted to add. Sorry, I had trouble unmuting myself. Thank you very much, Jacques. Um, we're nearly run out of time, um, but there are certain calculations that we haven't looked at that are very important where we actually saw that in some of the EDPs that you have sent in before the training, there might have been some problems and, and that's the cash, cash flow analysis. 
Um, so I would suggest that, because um, we do need to stop on time, that tomorrow morning we will have a quick um, recap of all the different calculations we looked at so far. And I would really encourage you to reflect um, back in the past where you've maybe had problems around the calculations that we've talked about so far. Um, and then once we've done that, we will we will tackle the cash flow analysis and some other calculations if that's if that's agreeable to you. Let me stop sharing so I can see you. Um, is there perhaps one more question now that you would like to have answered on all the things that we've talked about so far? We have two minutes left. Yes, it, it would be really good for us to get an understanding of where perhaps and what are, what were the calculations that entrepreneurs had difficulty with um, when you were implementing MAND. Um, so we could also discuss that tomorrow morning, um, or what they found particularly easy to do, um, which aspect of the enterprise development plan there was struggle with. Okay. So uh, if there are no more questions for now, I would like to thank you all very much again for being present and for, for, for working and, and being focused. Um, and um, I will see you all uh, hopefully tomorrow, same time, same place. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.